All right, Dr. Dennis, thank you for joining us. I really Hi, appreciate yeah. you sacrificing some of your time and residency for you know talking to medical students. No problem. Happy to do it. It was really nice of you guys to to reach out. So, yeah, yeah, these are really great interviews. We really appreciate them. Um, but okay, anyway, so we we have some kind of stock questions we'll go through. And uh, first, just to start off, you know, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, like your hometown, where you went to undergrad, and what you did as a major, and then you know where you went to medical school. Yeah, um, so I'm actually from Toledo, Ohio, uh, so so not too far from Lansing. Um, and then I went to undergrad at Ohio University, and um, that's in Athens, Ohio. And I did uh, like biology and chemistry, and then um, kind of wanted to fly south for a little <laughs> while. Uh, so I went to medical school actually in um, at Lecom Bradenton, so the Bradenton campus in Florida, which is like just south of Sarasota, and that was. It was a nice change of pace for a few years, <laughs> yeah. Um, being being down in the sun and the warmth, and then, um, but actually for like my third and fourth year for clinicals, I went to up to Pennsylvania and was in Meadville, so I've kind of been all over recently. <laughs> bit of a bit of a shift from uh, Bradenton to uh, Lansing, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's. Uh, I lived in Tampa for a little while when I was in the military, so uh, I know oh, the area a little bit and. I miss, I miss the, uh, at least I miss December. I don't know if I miss July. Yeah. Yeah. It has, a, you know, everyone, every place has its ups and downs, but it was yeah, good. True. Um, cool. So uh, what made you decide to go into urology? Um, you know, so when I was in medical school, I figured out that I wanted to do surgery because I kind of learned things about myself going through clinicals. Like I like being able to actually fix a problem. Um, which surgery obviously tends to lend itself to, but I still liked having patient follow-up and I kind of just explored a lot of different surgical subspecialties. I did an ENT rotation. I did, you know, obviously we have to do general surgery. I thought about doing ophthalmology, but um, there was actually a urologist that I rotated with in Meadville, Pennsylvania, who actually happened to graduate from the program I'm in now. <clears throat> oh, wow. Um, so it was kind of like serendipitous. Um but she, uh, I did a rotation with her and, you know, at first, like, I wasn't like, oh, I wasn't like in love with urology at first. I was like, oh, it's, you know, it's all right. It's fine. You do a lot of like stones and stuff. And I didn't quite like grasp what it was all about until I rotated with her again and got like to see even more, um, of what we get to do. And as I went through my, um, like sub eyes and everything, I just really felt like I fit in with urologists as like a group of people. Um, you know, everyone <laughs> doing what we do, you have to have somewhat of a decent sense of humor about it. Um, and you get just some really weird, interesting <laughs> cases. I mean, you can in every field, but just some really, <laughs> some really interesting stuff. And um, I don't know, I just always kind of like felt at home when I was doing urology. So Awesome. Yeah. I, I, that's something that common I hear is, you know, people are like, oh, I wanted to do surgery, but I, you know, did, wasn't sure, but then I rotated with field X and I ended up loving it. Right. Um, yeah. So that's awesome yeah. that you found that really cool. Um, okay. So then uh, you, once you decided on urology, what made you decide, and obviously you actually kind of already answered this maybe a little, but uh, what made you decide on that residency program? And did you have any special criteria that you were looking for when you were like interviewing at different residencies? Like, oh, I don't, I don't like this feature or I really need this feature. Yeah. Um, so the biggest thing for me when I was looking at programs was actually more the, how the residency or the residents interacted with one another and what their like dynamic and, you know, bonding was like, and if they seem to like, you know, actually get along well, or if everyone just kind of worked together and went home or kind of like what the <laughs> dynamic was like, because I mean, it, I mean, it is true when you're in residency or hospitals like home away from home really feels more like my actual home sometimes um, and I remember when I was rotating through I just really wanted to find a place where I felt like I fit in best and where I'd be happiest as you can be anyway spending you know 70 plus hours a week with those people <laughs> um, so that was one of the biggest things for me was was the sort of the dynamic of the residents in the program and what the culture was like um, after that, it was, you know, something that kind of drew me to Lansing specifically. And it, I, you know, it is true that the Dr. Dr. Bridger was her name, but that she came from this program and she did recommend it, but there's, you know, 
tons of other <laughs> excellent programs and that I considered. But the other thing about Lansing was really the um, like really high volume of clinical cases. And I remember when I was a med student doing a sub I here that I thought to myself, you know, like, oh man, if I, if I decide to come here, I'm going to like work my butt off, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like they have some, we have some, we work with a really wide variety of um, faculty and we have some private practice docs that just, you know, I mean, they, they work a lot and we cover all their cases and it's really good operative experience. And a lot of times you're one-on-one -on -one with them. So I just knew that I'd come out, um, you know, for the better, even though there were going to be days <laughs> when I'd be there until like eight or nine o'clock still doing yeah. like elective cases or whatever. And I'd probably be hating life in that moment, but in the long term that was, you know, going to help me be the best urologist and surgeon or whatever that I could hopefully be. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Especially, you know, saying that you felt you like you fit in a lot, but then also that you're going to get a volume of cases and be a good surgeon at the end of it. That's a really positive thing. So, you yeah. know, for the future urologists out there, Sparrow sounds like a good, uh, a good choice. So, <laughs> yeah. And then, um, um, actually when I was, when I started here, everything really changed my intern year. We used to not really have any fellowship trained urologists, which for me, it wasn't particularly huge deal. And then over the last two years in the program, we literally have added a uh, like andrology fellowship trained urologist, like someone in robotics, someone in female and someone in reconstructive surgery. So we basically now have all the, that was the only, not only, but that was like the biggest drawback of this program to me was that we didn't have that much, you know, much in the way of like fellowship trained physicians. And that's totally different now too. So it's, it was a, uh, ended up working out very well. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really cool. I don't know. I don't actually know much about urology. I, I assume I'll find out more next year, uh, third year, but yeah. uh, sounds like, you know, it, you know, sometimes I, I think, you know, it's, it's stuff like that's really important stuff that you don't think about when you're looking at a program and then you find out later, like, oh, I wish there were, you know, fellows and stuff like that. So it's really cool that that worked out for you. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, so I know this is a weird question, um, but it's a really popular question, which is what is a typical day like? And I know, you know, you're a surgeon, so that's not a real question. So maybe a couple typical days uh, would yeah. work better. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have like a general outline for most of our days. So, um, and it's, it'll be different, you know, program to program. Um, but what we do, you know, we don't necessarily group round, um, you know, maybe earlier on when you're just starting, you'll round with one of the chiefs or like one of the seniors on, on your patients, but we sort of independently round on our patients between like six and seven. And then we meet at seven or 645, depending on how busy the day looks um, and like sign out together. So everybody knows, you know, all of the patients that we're following or that we're, you know, operated on or whatever. Um, and then usually 7.30 or 8 o'clock, that's when cases get started. Or if you're going to clinic that day, then, you know, go to clinic. Um, and then usually there's like a couple people of our team that are sort of dedicated to being on the floor to take care of like consults or follow up on things for our patients that we're following um, or what have you. And we do about two half days of clinic a week usually. So we don't do like one full day of clinic, which is kind of nice because think most people going into surgery enjoy more doing things in the yeah. OR so it's, it's kind of nice to just split that up um, and uh, yeah I mean we're usually in the OR you know most days um, so that's that's sort of like typical and then Wednesdays and Fridays we also have um, a few hours of didactics so um, helps kind of break things up a little bit too. That's awesome then, yeah. Um, as far as call goes, actually, yeah, we're on call like once a night during the week and we take home call, which is nice. So that once you do finish up all your stuff at the hospital, you can still, you know, go home, take call from home. And then um, we usually are on like one every five to six weekends because um, we split it evenly between all of us, like from the juniors through the seniors, everyone pretty much takes the same amount of call to just make it nicer for everybody all the way through. Your intern year is different, you know, because you're on like general surgery a lot. You're more like one every other weekend, which kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah. For that year. Um, but once you get through there, two, two through five, it's, weekends are much better. <laughs> yeah. I feel like everyone knows intern year is kind of a black hole of yeah, time just, suck. And yeah. Yeah. It's rough. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Great. Uh, so we talked a little bit about that. What about uh, your future? Like, what type of setting do you hope to practice in? And I, I interviewed someone else and they said that you know, sometimes that, that private and, and working in an academic setting kind of blend. So 
you know, it could be that, but what, what do you think you'll practice in the future, you know, private practice or academic, that kind of stuff? Yeah, that is a good question and not an easy one for me to answer because <laughs> I'm trying to answer that. Like, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot lately because I, uh, originally when I came in, I was like pretty sure that I wanted to do a fellowship. Um, and as I've been going through, I'm just realizing that I don't know if I, I mean, I love all of urology. I don't know if I love one area enough to really want to like spend extra time doing it and then like really make that my niche. I kind of like general urology. Um, so I'm not sure that I want to do a fellowship or like really focus on academic medicine. Um, but <laughs> like, I, I keep going back and forth. So it's, it's hard for me to say, I could tell you one thing today and then two weeks from now, it's probably going to be totally different, but I think, um, they each have sort of their own pros and cons. Uh, but I do actually something that's would be important to me in the future is some degree of like teaching or giving back, um, Cause I, but we, you know, work with, you know, private urologists in our, in our residency. And I think being able to be connected through something like that would be, be important to me. But as far as academics versus like, I, I just I haven't decided yet. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, it happens in med school too, as you, I'm sure you experienced too, you know, you just, you think, oh, I'm definitely going to do this. And you're like, oh, actually this other thing is kind of cool or, or whatever, you know? Yeah, interestingly, when I started med school, I was like dead set on doing cardiology. Um, so that's what I thought I was going to do. And then my med school had this like buddy system where they paired you with someone a year before you that also wants to do what you want to do. So I got <laughs> paired with uh, his name is Stephen Allegro, and he wanted to do your or do cardiology. He graduated the year before me, did a total 180 and did urology also. <laughs> so I thought they did a nice job pairing us because we both shifted from one thing to the same thing. I that was really funny. They somehow knew that when you put cardiology on the form, you actually met urology. <laughs> actually, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, so do you have any advice for people that are considering your specialty? Like, you know, if it'll help them decide this is it or like things to prepare for, if like I'm dead set on urology, these are the things I need to do, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so this sort of actually touches on, you know, what you said, but interestingly, just really try to get some early exposure to urology in terms of, I mean, just even like spending days with people in the clinic or whatever you really can do if, if you know, you think it might be something you're interested in because, I mean, you really don't get that much exposure to it in, in med school. And I think yeah. it's like a pretty misunderstood specialty. I mean, you know, like at least, especially for patients and like sometimes even for other people in medicine, they're like, I don't, you know, what, what do you do? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, so I, I think getting like early exposure, trying to really figure out what it's all about, um, you know, is, is a good thing to, to start. And then um, the other thing I would say is, you know, even if you're not super excited about doing research, probably trying to do some sort of research project, even, even if it's not necessarily urology related, um, doing that sort of early on is bigger thing that programs are looking at now. Um, and then I, I'd say the biggest thing you can probably do for yourself is that early exposure. And then in that finding like a mentor or somebody that's going to be able to sort of help guide you through the process. Um, yeah. I mean, of course, like for everything else, like I said, research and trying to do well on your board exams. Yeah. Uh, kind of a plug for SOSA at MSUCOM is that our SOSA advisor, Dr. Harding, is a urologist. So, you know, any members at uh, MSUCOM yeah. that are listening and interested in urology, Dr. Harding is a great uh, person to consider as a mentor. So, which is how I've, you know, gotten in contact with you. So, yeah. No, anyway, it's been great. So, yeah. Would anyway, I. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the advice there. It's 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 tough as a medical student to try to figure out like, you know, oh, I'm interested in this kind of competitive specialty that I probably need to decide on before third year, but don't really have exposure to, um, you know, so it's that's good. That's good advice. Getting the early exposure. I like that. And then, you know, doing sub eyes, I was going to touch on this later, probably, but like doing away rotations in, in different, you know, hospitals or whatever programs that you're considering is, is a really big deal. Um, I know in some fields, it's kind of, I don't know any, much about urology at all, but in some fields, it's considered like almost a requirement. Like if you don't do a sub I, you are not going to match there. Is it similar in urology or somewhat similar? It's somewhat similar for like some of the really like much, you know, 
bigger like academic places it's I don't think it's as big of a deal there I think they're probably more just like application based but especially for like any like DO programs that was like historically has been I mean it's not like make it or break it but I it's very helpful in terms of you know are you going to pick someone that you spend 15 to 20 minutes interviewing or like 30 minutes interviewing and spend one day with or like somebody that you've seen for two to four weeks and have a better idea of getting to know them. And I think that's been actually really, really challenging this year with the limitations on everything in COVID because it's really kind of adjusted how we're able to do things. So it's kind of thrown a wrench in the situation. So maybe, maybe that'll change. I don't know, <laughs> but historically it's, it's been, you know, really helpful to try and get yourself out there and, and, you know, meet people and spend time at programs. Even if, you know, if you don't have time or your school won't let you do a sub I just like coming for a few days for like didactics or something, if you can get in touch with their program directors, it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you did a, a sub I at Sparrow and then ended up at Sparrow. So that, you know, kind of <laughs> N equals one, but you know, yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. So this is a, this is like our last structured question that we ask everybody, and it's my favorite one because it allows you to talk about something you really love, which is you know, do you have a favorite case or a patient? Obviously, you don't have to talk about HIPAA or anything, but you know, a case or patient that you just really love doing or really loved your interaction with that patient, um, something that you just you're really passionate about. Hmm. I have a couple little thoughts that come to mind. Um, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Uh, one, uh, like, so as far as a case that I really enjoy doing, or just, you know, any, this isn't about a specific patient, although it will apply to this person. So, um, I like urethroplasties a lot, which is like a, you know, surgery for opening up the urethra. If you have like some stricture disease, um, which can happen if, I mean, there's a whole wide variety of reasons that can happen. One, one of them is like trauma. Um, so we had, a like a younger male patient that had come in after a car accident. And I mean, he was, you know, young and <laughs> ended up having like pelvic fractures and had to have a super pubic tube placed because he had like a urethral disruption where his urethra wasn't aligned anymore. It had been, you know, because of the pelvic fractures. And um, so that, <laughs> that he was like somebody that actually spanned, you know, several months to like a year of my, my training. So, um, that we were sort of following along with him. Cause we first put in the super pubic tube and it was like hard for him to adjust to having like life with that until we could do an actual urethroplasty where you go back in and sort of like realign things and, and fix the, um, you know, what had happened with his pelvic fractures. And, um, I don't know, it was just, it was really, you know, nice to be able to sort of like see someone through that from like beginning to putting in the super pubic tube from when everything initially started to helping him adjust to that until he could get a, you know, a, you know, get it fixed properly and then having a regular urethral foley for a while, which is challenging for like, a, you know, a young man. And then, you know, finally being able to like actually pee again. <laughs> yeah, no, um, seriously. Yeah. So that was like, and I, I just remember because I actually interacted with him the very first night that I took call by myself. <laughs> wow. So that was like a, yeah, that was, that was a, it was a good learning experience for me. Yeah. Um, that's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. And plus, you know, urethroplasty is like one of my favorite cases to do. It's really, really cool, interesting stuff. Um, it's usually like harvest a piece of buccal mucosa from your mouth and you can like graft it onto the urethra to help open things up and everything's pretty cool. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, a, and a good outcome, I'm assuming, is could yeah. <laughs> have full function at the end. It's a good yeah. outcome. Yeah, yeah. So um, that was a good, like a good experience. Um, and then, you know, like some other patients <laughs> that I've just like come across with that I've, you know, sort of had more of a, a connection with, like, and it's, it's silly stuff, I think, sometimes to us, because you like we deal with people that have catheters like every single day, you know, and I think to us, sometimes it can be like not a very big deal. Um, but when you really like stop and think about it, like having a catheter, like a tube hanging out of your penis or whatever, <laughs> like long-term is like a, a, it's like really uncomfortable for some people. And it's like a bigger deal than I think we sometimes realize because it's like so much of our bread and butter. Um, and there was like one patient that I saw sort of recently who was just having a really rough time as far as like stuff that he was going through personally with like his 
wife of however many years passing away and a few years ago his son before that had passed away and just like didn't have family around here and then had this catheter and he was just I just talked to this man in the ER for like a really long time um <laughs> like about life with a catheter and like I, and it sounds really like silly or trivial but um you know he was just like having a rough time and then being able to just have sort of that human interaction especially with COVID he like wasn't going out or doing anything and um, I don't know. He like sticks out in my brain a lot too. Just that stuff that we all look for in medicine, which is just, you know, being able to like actually help someone or like make a difference. Cause he wrote me like a thank you note and stuff, you know, yeah. like, it was really appreciative. So. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's perfect. Like that's what we should all be trying to do is heal people and make their lives better in some way. Um, I hope that's why everyone's in med school. So I'm glad that <laughs> yeah. you're able to do that. That's awesome. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of it for my like structured questions. If you have any other general comments that you think would be helpful um, or anything that you think is like particular to you, like, you know, a specific thing, like, you know, have you had trouble because, you know, most of the people at your residency are men? I don't know if that's the case for you, but sometimes people talk about that. It is the case for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, like a couple of things just about like urology in general and like getting into urology programs. I mean, it is, it's a competitive field, you know? So like the standard stuff that's important for everything, like research and scores and, you know, doing like sub eyes are important, but I think like the stuff that's usually stuck out to me, especially in people where I just get to like read their applications or I don't get to spend that much time with them is like more like them being like fun, well-rounded people, which is maybe why I liked, I mean, not like it's not like that in other specialties, but um, <laughs> like why I liked it here. I think, you know, medicine and your job and residency is like one part of your life, but I, I like multidimensional people. <laughs> so <laughs> I think, um, you know, having other memorable or like other facets of your personality or your application or whatever that sort of <clears throat> set out or set you apart or help you stand out. Um, can be really helpful. Um, just something to consider, you know, like don't, uh, it's medicine's important, but don't let it consume your entire life. Although that's kind of hard sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, as far as that, uh, I am actually right now, there was another female in our program. She graduated the other year and right now I'm the only female in our program, not oh, wow. like by design or anything. We just only take two residents a year and that's just how the matches have lined up. We've ranked women highly, just they ended up going elsewhere or whatever happened. So yeah. um, I am the only female in, like resident in the program right now. And I don't, at least like among my like co-residents or like my workplace environment, I really don't notice anything differently, but as terms of like being in the specialty that I'm in, which is a lot of male genitalia, <laughs> you know, like, um, they sometimes I, it's more the patients like, like, Oh <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you about my erectile dysfunction. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, it's a little bit more of a hurdle sometimes in terms of how I interact with patients or maybe they're like somewhat more reluctant to tell me about their issues, but I've started just being way more blunt, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, um, I think when I started out and I would go see patients in the clinic, be like, oh, you know, you know why they're there. You have their chief complaint or like whatever it is that's bringing them to the office. And I'd kind of try to let them tell me. And now if it seems like it's more of like a sensitive male issue, like erectile dysfunction, I'm like, oh, so you're having trouble getting erections, huh? Like I just lay it all out on the table yeah. so that they don't have to like try to bring it up themselves. Um, so it's been sort of a little bit more of a learning experience for me, learning how to sort of navigate those semi-awkward waters as far as like for the patient sometimes it's not awkward for me that's what I do all day every day but that's not what yeah. they do all day every day <laughs> yeah I think I think that's you made it you made this point earlier about like you're a physician you're a urologist or training urologist and you this is your day-to-day -day life so it's not 
weird to you, but for other people, it's very weird. I think that's true probably in every branch of medicine, mm -hmm. whatever you're doing is not weird, but to other people, it's like, this yeah. is the worst thing that's ever happened to me, you know? Yeah. Um, that's really cool. And, you know, on the topic of being in a residency that is super male dominated, not uh, like you said, not by design, but I think that's a good reason. I'm, I'm glad we're interviewing you. Maybe it'll give some females that are in at MSU Com some, you know, inspiration to you yeah. know, apply and go to Sparrow. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's a uh, it's a good like group too. I mean, we have a we have a good time. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Well, that about wraps it up for me. Thank you so much.